very very good afternoon and evening to my uh, fellow speakers at the jan hastakshep uh, meeting uh, i'm begin with an apology that i couldn't be there i've got this terrible chest congestion and the pollution in delhi was a bit daunting i particularly feel honored to be in the presence of two former members of the indian judiciary who have renewed hope in our uh, system and the constitution in recent times thank you very very much for allowing me this chance to speak i decided today to kind of concentrate my uh, 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 intervention or presentation on the issue of undermining of in, uh, india and the constitution uh, while hate, i've titled it saying hate speech is rampant while speech it's free speech is criminalized so the whole thrust is that the widespread prevalence of hate speech which is undermining our constitution institution state and society while free speech for dissenters is being criminalized we are presently in 2022 at a time when very consistent and very subversive attempts are being made to perpetrate hate speech legitimize hate, hate speech and hate letting as a means of dehumanizing and invisibilizing large sections of the indian population specifically and targetedly muslims the indian constitution as the bedrock of indian state and society is under direct attack from these systemic attempts sinister and defiant currently the honorable supreme court is hearing three petitions around this crucial issue and the issues framed in the outcome will have a bearing on how this constitutional mandate will be finally upheld let's not forget the concerted defiance of quote unquote leaders of majoritarian supremacist movements to orders of the constitutional courts on hate speech just days ago the notorious political religious figure yati narsingh anand a new found hate monger responsible for the genocidal calls against indian muslims in december 2021 and jan 2022 has defiantly told the up police that he will continue with his proposed quote unquote dharm sansad despite mild, mild attempts of the police of that state to curtail him this too happened only after the supreme court order to pros- prosecute the, the genocidal calls the widespread and pretty potent and brazen use of hate speech against politically targeted sections not only makes their human conditions prone to discrimination and outright violence it renders articles 14 15 16 19 and 21 of the constitution hollowed out and shallow the radio silence from the top political leadership occupying constitutional positions in fact gives the stamp of complicity to this hate speech before i go into hate hate and insightful speech further i wish to draw the ironic parallel to what is happening to article 191a and article 191b at the same time that hate speech is so being insidiously legitimized the right to free speech and expression including the fundamental right to protest and assemble peacefully without arms is under attack and dissenters criminalized we have been witness to the rather worrisome high court decisions recent where slogans like inkalab zindabad and criticisms of the achhe din slogan propaganda slogan by the ruling regime are seen as problematic seen as they are uttered by young leaders who have been incarcerated under the dreaded uapa who were those incarcerated after the vibrant and constitutional protests against caa 2019 and the proposed ncr npr in delhi between april june 2020 and thereafter the identities of those incarcerated becomes particularly crucial because short of one or two women leaders most of those incarcerated are young muslim intellectuals and leaders what i'd like to do is look at the kind of acceleration of hate as first a political tool as we saw it for decades from the 60s 70s 80s 1990s 2000s uh, after independence and now a full <coughs> blown phenomenon that we are witnessing hate as state project and hate as media design we've seen and analyzed some of us working on this issue since the mid 1980s that we saw high court decisions particularly of the constitutional courts in bombay trying to uh, ensure that the hate speech at election time under 123a and 123b of the representation of people's act is penalized and prosecuted uh, we also analyzed <coughs> this was a particularly passionate project of mine inquiry commission reports of the jabalpur rachi 
Telicheri, <coughs> Kanyakumari, Bombay Bhivandi violences of the 60s and 70s and 80s. And what we see is this entire phenomenon of uh, who cast the first stone emerging, which I sort of formulated after the Bombay 92-93 violence, when I have argued before and since that the, that the, that the issue of violence during communal uh, upsurges should not be ju judged when the first physical stone is cast, but should also be looked at as consistent provocation and incitement for months and weeks prior to the incidents erupting in violence. Because we see, <coughs> as our inquiry commissions have demonstrated, that widespread, unprosecuted, non-penalized hate speech <coughs> by leaders and members of politically powerful majority outfits have been allowed to create a, a social and public atmosphere that finally uh, allows the violence to erupt. So hate speech is one of those queer phenomenons that we are dealing with. Uh, political debate and political understanding around hate speech needs to emerge. Uh, and uh, while the more recent jurisprudence of the Supreme Court, whether it's in the 2004 Pravin Togadia case, the 2014 Pravasi Bhalai Sangatan case, the um, uh, uh, Tehsin Punawala uh, case, or the Amesh Devgan 2021 observations, while that is certainly uh, a welcome uh, further development after uh, relative, I would say, silence on uh, silent jurisprudence around hate speech for decades after independence. Uh, the challenge before this constitutional courts remain, particularly the Supreme Court, that how do their uh, directives get implemented on the ground? Particularly if you have a radio silence from the political executive that is not really concerned about curtailing hate speech at all, but has been part of a wider ecosystem of using hate as a political tool. So these are the challenges before us, which I'd like to just flag here. I'd also like to raise issues about the Indian state, media corporations and social media when it comes to hate. Like to raise the issue of, uh, again, the reluctance of the political leadership who's holding constitutional positions to act and prosecute. That message then being carried through to the uh, organizations like the police and other agencies who who view uh, offenses in a, in, a, in a prejudicial light, who do not see offenses of hate against targeted, vulnerable, marginalized sections as offenses at all. And therefore, the law, as it stands on paper, even as it stands on paper, remains unprosecuted. Uh, there have, of course, been uh, uh, flashes of hope uh, in the manner in which the National Broadcasting Statute, uh, the Digital Statutory Authority has responded uh, uh, to, to individual complaints being filed, uh, holding that the way television anchors behave, for instance, violates uh, the, uh, the guidelines of the NBDSA and the Constitution. Uh, in, in a recent case, by filed by an individual, uh, 50,000 rupees was actually levied on one of the TV channels. So these are welcome developments and these are developments that need to be pursued and pushed by citizens and groups. But the challenge still remains before the constitutional courts is how do you get directives implemented? How do you get the constitutional vision and the constitutional uh, non-negotiable about Article 14, 15, 16, 19 and 21, equality dis uh, and dignity and non-discrimination for all citizens, right to life with dignity for all citizens, regardless of gender, caste, community, and class implemented on the ground. Uh, are we on the verge of a society that is on tenterhooks? Uh, we have seen instances of mob lynching. We have seen, uh, seen instances of, uh, uh, in Karnataka, for instance, that a call given by a one rabid outfit actually, you know, on the ground results in attacks and deaths of a person, two persons belonging to the minority community running shops and the call was for the boycott, economic boycott of the Muslim community. So these are real challenges for all of us and uh, I really uh, uh, again thank Jan Hastakshep for giving me this opportunity. Friends, uh, December 2021 and the new year 2022 saw an all-out call for the mass killing stroke genocide of Muslims from one of India's North Indian uh, quote-unquote holy cities. We saw attacks on Christians across the country and uh, we saw Christians unable to attend church and enjoy Christmas. Uh, 
India's largest majority Muslims and women and girls of the Muslim community were the most specific and debasing target. And I wish to flag this because in the in the in the extent of what this hate uh, letting has done to us over the last eight nine years, particularly, is a is a kind of a uh, further numbing of public memory. So I think it's important that we use occasions like this to re uh, ignite some of those very very difficult and debasing memories, uh, and dedicate ourselves to ensuring that we uh, ourselves and be become voices uh, against those uh, who are being on a day-to-day -day basis, minute-by-minute -minute basis, uh, uh, dehumanized on social media and on quote-unquote commercial television. Uh, we saw Twitter accounts, uh, we saw GitHub and Clubhouse platforms, where the macabre and shameful phenomenon of the auctions of Muslim women took place. Again, there was a radio silence from the political leadership and uh, uh, showing a kind of a silence of complicity. Uh, June 2021 was when the first time this happened, uh, when you saw, uh, you know, and we might, we complained about it to Twitter and uh, Citizens for Justice and Peace and about 21 of the Twitter accounts were pulled down. Uh, but then you saw Get House and Clubhouse being used six months later. And and, and, and you relentlessly complain, you, you try and get uh, it penalized and prosecuted, and then suddenly you see uh, it emerge on another platform. Uh, so I think it's a huge challenge for all of us to understand that how do we build up a, a political voice, a politically coherent voice, a politically coherent citizen's voice against this kind of hate letting. Uh, I'd also like to flag an issue which bothers uh, many of us activists uh, and academics, which is the uh, relative silence uh, from the political opposition, except for sections of the left uh, and prominent sections of the left who speak uh, openly and uh, very vocally on this issue, that the quote-unquote other opposition parties are very, very dif diffident and reluctant to take on uh, politically powerful hate speech. And this allows hate speech to gain wider currency and get wider acceptance in society. I think the silence from the political opposition is something that needs to be uh, thought about and uh, criticized because if we are talking about constitutional values being deepened and revived in this country, we need to recognize that hate speech of the kind that we've seen uh, flourish and leg being legitimized in the last eight or nine years is something that is just uh, not on. Uh, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the major issues of challenge for organizations and individuals like me and us at CJP is the is the kind of uh, nexus between the Indian state media corporations and social media that we are seeing. And uh, I just want to flag, which many of us know and have read, that studies on this done by Cambridge Analytica, Oxford, and some in uh, investigations by even Wall Street Journal point to and the manipulation of political attitudes and choices by parties and corporations in power through the misuse of privacy and data. So we are seeing a pretty sinister <coughs> level of our manipulation of propaganda at work and how do we in that context, context deal with it. Uh, just to be able to understand how <coughs> social media works and we've been engaged with this constant up and down with Facebook and uh, particularly uh, for the last three and a half years and uh, 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 in March 2021, Facebook finally concluded that Raja Singh, one of the very notorious hate offenders from Telangana, uh, he violated uh, their own community standards on objectionable content and criminal behavior. Uh, and he was removed from Facebook. Uh, his fan pages with 2,19,430 followers and another page with 17,018 followers continue to operate even today and they generate provocative context. Similar stark examples around the Delhi 2020 targeted violence of uh, Muslims in the capital. Uh, one example, Ragini Tiwari, Kill or Die Call, Kapil Mishra, Anjali Varma, show that it is the unchecked use of Facebook in non-English languages <coughs> that is instrumental in the spill and spiral of targeted violence. Facebook Incorporated has responded to just two complaints sent by us against hate content made by Ragini Tiwari, stating that they are not in a position to take any action against her. Instead, instead what they recommended to us is that we directly get uh, deal with Ms. Ms. Ragini Tiwari and get a resolution on the issue, which is a bit funny and a bit odd. 
There is another interesting serial offender uh, on on uh, on Facebook called Deepak Sharma, uh, and who again Facebook we find is extremely reluctant to disengage with. <coughs> Our team, uh, you know, sort of developed a detailed profile on on his activities through Facebook itself. We complained, we brought it up in writing and at roundtables with Facebook, and uh, <laughs> again we found a reluctance to act. Interestingly. Yati Narasimhan and Saraswati, who's in the news, a subject matter of a petition in the Supreme Court because of the Dharm Sansad genocidal call of December 2021. Interestingly, what we don't realize is that for years now, uh, Yati Narasimhan has been uh, responsible for kind of creating an ecosystem of hate. And during this elaborate process, CJP in November 2018, four years before the genocidal call to kill Muslims, was made by him. One of our members complained about his Facebook po post where he had said Hindus should be armed 24-7 to protect their religion and that Islam is cancer. And that time we were told by Facebook that this does not go against the community standards. But if we have an issue, we are free to block Yati or to unfollow his page. So this is the kind of extremely uh, reluctant uh, uh, response we've been getting from Facebook, which is a huge, huge player in the social media game and we know the numbers, we know the numbers of uh, that Facebook has and we know the impact uh, Facebook has made. <coughs> uh, just, just for the information of the valuable uh, uh, participants today, that Facebook India is a platform uh, with a vast clientele of 460 million plus users in English and 22 uh, Indian languages, that is total. English and Indian, 22 Indian languages. And we believe that it is in an unchecked manner allowing hate and insightful content and that therefore become an instrument for targeting minorities, Dalits and women. So I, I've already mentioned that uh, some of our uh, experiences with Facebook. In October 2018, we complained to Ms. Uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Anki Das, the public policy director, about the vandalization of a church in Varanasi, the St. Thomas Church in the Prime Minister's parliamentary constituency, by some uh, extremists. <coughs> uh, by uh, some of the persons involved in this extreme, extreme act, had also previously posted on Facebook inflammatory ta content targeting the Christian community. We got no response from the from the media platform. We got no response from Facebook at all. Uh, I've al already mentioned that consistently we've been uh, uh, mentioning Raja Singh's uh, uh, use or misuse of the Facebook platform uh, when he uh, half a million viewers, where he had, had a hateful speech on the uh, Amarnath Yatra. Uh, I'm talking about this was in 2019 and finally it was in March 2021 that uh, Facebook concluded that yes, he had violated its own community standards. Uh, so I think we need to also grapple with this entire uh, phenomenon of social media platforms and how they very easily uh, respond uh, to the algorithms of hate and negativity uh, rather than uh, community building constitutional values, peace building and harmony. And how do we in a democracy, which we certainly believe in free speech, I would certainly never ever be an advocate for censorship. How do we ever, how do we deal with this phenomenon? Uh, so uh, like I mentioned at, at the start, uh, we, we see today a phenomenon of, you know, hate as state tool, hate as media design. And we saw previously in decades before that, hate as a uh, uh, political tool. So uh, I think uh, the the recent developments uh, in the Supreme Court really bear watching and have given us encouragement, particularly when they have uh, they have referred to the 2017 Law Commission of India report, uh, where again they've reiterated that what we don't need is necessarily more laws and more this, but maybe tweaking of a few sections of the law. For instance, that they proposed the Criminal Law Amendment Bill of 2017, suggesting the insertion of a new section, <coughs> 153. C, prohibiting incitement uh, uh, to hatred and section 505A, causing fear, alarm, provocation of violence in certain cases and next as part of their, the Law Commission report. Uh, I think this is, this is something we need to uh, really uh, think through, debate and uh, hopefully we will see some, something emerging uh, from, the, from the Supreme Court itself. Uh, 
the, a recent observation by another bench of the Supreme Court uh, hearing a petition where they've really come down heavily on television anchors also bears some uh, recollection where uh, where we because we find increasingly that some TV uh, television anchors again with a huge following they've moved channels in fact one such notorious name has moved from one channel to another and has carried that uh, that agenda or hate agenda with him uh, it almost seems as if there is a certain currency market and currency for that hate and I think uh, without naming names and without getting interested in naming the either channels or the anchors, it's very, very important that we as a concerned group that is that is that is concerned about uh, undermining of India's institutions. And I believe the undermining of the Indian constitution itself and state and society, particularly Article 14, 16, 19, 21, is the ultimate aim and political uh, design uh, of consistent unprosecuted, unpenalized use of hate speech. And uh, we, we see, many of us who work with communities on the ground across the country, see its impact on the ground. We've seen uh, ghettoization of our cities and mohallas. We've seen, and this is not, this is just not the last eight, nine years. We see it after every major bout of uh, communal violence. We saw ghettoization after 92, 93 Bombay. We saw it after 2002 in Gujarat. And in fact, Johapar, Johapura, grew exponentially in Ahmedabad by three times. And uh, in all these cases of large-scale violence, the use of, uh, before the violence broke out, the use of hate speech and the consistent non-prosecution of hate speech, despite, uh, as, as we saw in uh, 2002, the recommendations of some police officers that that speech should be prosecuted is, uh, is something that we need to really, really uh, think about protest and uh, and uh, and uh, uh, build a movement around. I think the only way to uh, challenge this pernicious use of hate speech which uh, on the one hand and defending free speech on the other is by creating communities and groups of citizens on the ground who will consistently with the administration, uh, be it the district administration or the police, challenge these uh, violations of Indian law and ensure some penal and prosecution, penal, penal action and prosecution. Uh, our experience in dealing with the violence on the ground and communal violence on the grounds tells us that unfortunately the groups that are consistently interacting with the administration and police are those that are violating the law and the constitution. So if citizens who are in fact interested in upholding the constitution and the rule of law and uh, uh, constitutional values which will protect the more vulnerable sections of our people need to come out of our shell and maybe interact more with district administrations, dis the district police uh, to ensure that such uh, uh, hate speech is both penalized and prosecuted. There, there, there could be, of course, much more that we can say on this question. I do not want to go into quotations from uh, the recent observations of the Supreme Court. But I would like to share here that recently the NBDSA had fined a uh, a pretty well-watched television ch channel, rupees 50,000, for repeat hate violations by one anchor. Uh, and similarly, uh, on, on, on at least nine of our complaints against four different channels, uh, including one particularly... Uh, vicious uh, portrayal of a quote-unquote bombing in the West Bengal school which never happened. The, uh, the channel had ordered the pulling down of the video. We have seen in the last two and a half years use of, uh, use of uh, pernicious phrases on electronic media channels of, the, of, of, of a varying kind. Vaccine jihad, conversion jihad, zameen jihad. Uh, then extremely uh, vicious language around the hijab con controversy being used to uh, demonize Islam and Muslims. And I think as Indians, all of us, regardless of which faith we belong to, we need to very, very clearly uh, think up uh, strategies of citizens' mobilizations around uh, and against hate speech and uh, insightful speech. I'd also like to flag here that what we've seen in our country over the last eight, nine years, when we talk about the undermining of institutions, is that while on the one hand, <coughs> and I'll repeat what I said right at the start, that while on the one hand we see 
uh, a complete non penalization and non prosecution of hate speech whereby article 14 15 16 19 and 21 of the constitution when it comes to equality non discrimination and the right to live with dignity of large sections of indians is being undermined and denied uh, quite apart from the fact that very often they are subject to direct violence and ostracism uh, uh, there's an ironic parallel that what is ha- what is happening to art- my and your article 191a and 191b which allows us to speak freely uh, 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 as long as we speak uh, in, in constitutional language and assemble and protest peacefully without arms uh, where the right to f- free speech and expression uh, is being uh, is directly under attack and dissenters are being criminalized and therefore you have this duality which is extremely extremely worrying uh we we have seen in the in the three major uh, uh court uh, petitions supreme court petitions that are pending questions are asked of the state governments as to why the uh, the, the directors of the uh, supreme court on in the tehsin punawala case uh where district level instructions had been given by the supreme court on how <coughs> the build up to to hate uh, build up to lynching or mob violence should be curtailed uh and and that in, within which hate speech has a very important component uh, as to contributing uh, to to a certain social and political atmosphere we found initially that very few states had responded and uh, thereafter many states have of course filed their uh, affidavits uh, i would just like to also place on the table this concern as a social activist and academic that we need to also figure out how the lower judiciary uh lower judiciary actually understands and responds to the directives of the supreme court can there be a way in which the supreme court of india for instance sends its directives directly to every magistrate in the country or every sessions court in the country so that it's not just a communication that happens uh via the state agencies when a case comes up or by a uh, 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 citizens who has grievances or citizen complainant but can the higher judiciary not think of a systemic way in which its own instructions are directly sent to every magistrate and session court in this country because eventually the magistrate in this country and the session court is responsible not to the state government in power not to the police of that state but to the highest court of the land and i think that is something we really need to deliberate over uh, think about and place before uh, The, the the supreme court that can its instructions can its directives we see that the dk basu directives of 1997 onwards are rarely followed uh, by police across the political spectrum in our states so is there a way that the supreme court of india under the supreme court of india can think of communicating directly in this day and age of digitalization with the lower courts so that the allegiance of the lower courts is directly to the constitutional orders of the constitutional courts and therefore this the 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 quote and quote influence or hold that often the police and the state has on the lower judiciary uh, is is uh, insulated uh, uh i just uh, uh, like to conclude by 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 uh, mentioning that uh, uh, it it's it's an, it's been very fascinating and interesting exploration for me as somebody who's engaged with uh, mitigating uh, targeted communal violence for decades now uh, is to see that how much of our uh, uh, initial period 60s 70s 80s 90s early 2000s so much of our jurisprudence around hate speech emerged not in the courts but in the judicial commissions of inquiry i remember authoring this paper which i did for uh, for professor Sa- sp sathe uh, in the ferguson college pune uh, where i it was on hate speech and indian democracy where i argued that you know there was such a thin there was such a thin jurisprudence on hate speech and even when the opportunity arose after the 1990s of the for the supreme court to actually uh, take forward some of the bombay high court decisions there were issues there so i think uh, uh, the other thing that some 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 of us activists academics have been feeling which i like to flag particularly because our this panel is such an eminent panel is why is this absence of institutional memory in this country that if 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 commissions of inquiry if uh, have actually observed certain tendencies uh, around say hate speech and insightful speech which allows targeted violence to break out why are those findings and uh, observations 
why does that not become part of our lived jurisprudence? Uh, I'd like to uh, leave this August audience uh, with some of these questions and observations. I really, really regret the fact that I couldn't be there in person. And I uh, uh, thank you very, very much for this opportunity.